Is the Power PC worth it? You'll get a resounding yes from the folks here at Star Graphics, a pre-press shop in Foster City, California. They used to use a pretty powerful computer here, a Quadra 950. But using the 950, it used to take a minute or so to preview a complex graphic like this one. Now it takes about 10 seconds. Using the 950, it would take hours to perform a function called trapping. Now it takes about 20 minutes. Why? Because they've switched to the Power PC. Today, we'll show you what Power PC can do on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by Hewlett Packard, working with industry leaders to ensure compatibility across the board and across the network. HPPCs, you're looking at partnership in a whole new light. The Computer Chronicles is also made possible by the Software Publishers Association, providers of educational materials to help manage software. Don't copy that floppy. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Shafe. With me today is Tim Baharin, President of Creative Strategies, Hi. the most oft-quoted analyst in this industry. Tim, we're talking about PowerPC. I want to show one quick example of uh, what you can do with PowerPC. We're used to seeing QuickTime videos sure. running on a Mac, right? Watch what I can do with this particular Mac, which has a PowerPC chip. Cubic rotation of a QuickTime video. I could be doing this, in fact, with real live video coming out of a camera. That's a, amount of power. a lot of number crunching going on there. A couple of quick questions on Power Mac. Number one, hit or a miss so far? Well, it's a hit within the Mac community. I mean, it's very clear that they'll sell at least one million during the first 12 months of the Mac, this Power Mac's product uh, life cycle. The big question is, can they move this over to the general business market? And it's too early to tell. All right, that's the next question. Should I buy a Power Mac now? If you're a Mac user in the business world, the answer is yes, because there's native mode applications out there. We're going to get more in the next year, and it's a really good buy. But if you're doing it for small business, the 68,000 Mac is still okay. But is the 68K Mac history, is it going to be the Apple II of 1995? Well, not in 1995. I mean, it, there's no question that the Power Mac is their primary uh, platform. But I do believe that the original Mac is still good for home office, small business, and even for especially this multimedia home, and therefore it'll be around for quite a while. Tim, where is IBM and all this Power PC stuff? Yeah, IBM's official word is that they've put off bringing out a Power PC Mac now until around March of next year. And the reason they've given is that they wanted to have multiple operating systems to go at the same time. I think what really has happened is that the original OS 2 that they're designing for the Power PC is not available yet and probably won't be available until early next year, and that's what they're waiting for. Yeah. All right, today we're going to look at the Power PC chip. We'll see what RISC architecture gets you on a Macintosh. We'll do a benchmark test comparing a 66 megahertz Power PC Mac to a 66 megahertz Pentium on a Compact. We'll show you how Power PC speeds along applications like Excel and Photoshop. First of all, a little bit about the chip itself. For that story, we went to the PowerPC Design Center in Austin, Texas. Here at the Somerset Center in Austin, chip designers from IBM and Motorola collaborate with advisors from Apple Computer. You won't find company logos here. The idea is to maintain a kind of corporate neutrality so that everyone works together cooperatively instead of competitively. A Somerset was the name that the employees came up with. We wanted to name the building. We didn't want to call it a design center or a lab or anything. And Somerset represents a, a name chosen by the employees because it's the area in England where King Arthur used to bring his knights together at night to work on a, a lying, aligning the knights to go after a big quest and, and so on. So everybody thought Somerset was very representative. The Somerset Group plans a complete line of RISC chips. Since the alliance was announced in 1991, the Power PC chip has found its way into the Power Macintosh and now into a line of Unix-based machines. Unveiled recently by IBM, the new AIX systems include audio input and output functions, aspects of what IBM calls human-centric computing. Hello, I am Fred and I would like to introduce the new IBM Entry Level Workstation. The next step to an OS 2 or Windows Power PC is yet to be announced, but IBM continues to focus on the long-term approach. We view this as, as uh, not something where after two or three years we declare victory. This is, this is a long-term commitment from all the companies involved to migrate to this, uh, to this Power PC architecture. And so we kind of view it as a marathon. 
Like previous leaps in computer technology, PowerPC needs more than better performance to make itself, and that message hasn't been lost on the Somerset Alliance. There are many components of making a new architecture, a new computing standard, a household word. Again, we talked earlier about the thing that really drives this industry is volume. You know, why does the, the today's PC, for instance, you know, why is it a, is a household world? Because you see it uh, in every computer store you go into, you see it on the TV, uh, the average end user knows that if you're going to go out and, you know, if you're interested in a personal computer, use today's standard. We've got to do the same thing. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Victoria Smith. Well, if the proof is in the pudding, the power is really in the application. So let's start by looking at two computation-intensive computer applications and see how they run under PowerPC. Joan Morse is here for Microsoft to show us the newest version of Excel running on a Power Mac. And John Peck joins us from Adobe to show us the newest version of Photoshop running on a Power Mac. Joan, let's start with Excel. Uh, we think of graphics when we think of processor speed and taking advantage of the Power Mac, but a spreadsheet runs better with a faster processor too, right? Absolutely, absolutely. All right, let's, let's start with some of the new things in Excel that really uh, put demands on the processor. One thing is you have, uh, say, a list or really a database inside Excel, and you want to move the data around real fast. Uh, show me an example on list management that, that really pushes the processor. Sure. Well, one of the things we found is that all types of users spend a lot of time making lists in Excel, whether it's a recipe list or an address list or inventory parts or sales. And what they want to do is very easily get a subset or a view on their data. So with Excel 5, we give you something called auto filter, and you notice that what I what just happened is I got pop-up menus here, and these pop-up menus are smart, so to get a subset of the view on my data, all I have to do is point and click, so now I can see all my electronic sales. If I, I can print this out. If I want to, though, I can bring back all of my data just by turning the auto filter off, and I can get it back and do another different view. So a gigantic resort, boom, like that. Absolutely. Well, you bring up sorting, actually. We also make sorting a whole lot easier. In fact, all we have to do is tell Excel the, the way we want to sort the data. I want to see it by division. Click on OK and Excel automatically sorts it for me. Plus, co to combine that, we've given, given you something called subtotals. If we choose this, all I have to do is tell Excel the way I just sorted and ask it to give me subtotals, say, based on each different quarter. When I click on OK here, Excel does a tremendous amount of work. You can see that it's inserted rows at every break in division and uh, given me subtotals. It's also completely auto-outlined the sheet for me, so if I want to get a more executive view, I can just collapse it. All right, there is a graphics element to spreadsheets, of course. You do charts, you do graphs. Give me an example here. You've added something called drag and plot, yep. and what does that do? Well, it makes adding data series to a chart very easy. So what I'm going to do here is just quickly create a chart. Uh, we've had uh, the chart wizard since Excel 4, and what that allows me to do is simply point and click to get the chart type that I want. It gives me a little preview. I'm going to invert my data series here because I'd rather see the data by quarters. And now I can click to finish, and the chart that we just saw here automatically gets attached to my sheet. This is great. You're asking about drag and plot. You can see here that I forgot my fourth quarter data. We've made it a whole lot easier for you to add new data series simply by highlighting it and literally dragging it onto your chart. And Excel does all of the work for well, you. So it's a whole lot easier and certainly faster on a Power Mac than on a regular 68K. All right. Another example of really crunching a lot of data is something you do now called pivot tables, in which, again, you resort all the stuff real fast. Show me pivot tables. Absolutely. Well, you can see here we have a much larger database, right? And what we want to do is be able to make really smart decisions based on data like this if we're a business manager. So to help uh, people do that, we've provided something called pivot tables, and we've used a wizard to step people through the process, just like that chart wizard. So the first thing the wizard asks is, where, where's my data? And then what it does is it automatically picks up these labels here and presents them to me from inside of the wizard. So if I want to analyze my revenues, I can do that. And if I want to see sales by division or by channel, I can do that. All I have to do is drag and drop these labels to the appropriate place to get the view on the data that I want, click to finish, and you can see how fast the Power Mac is going to crunch through. I had several hundred rows of data here. You just change columns, change rows, and boom, the data went. Right. So now I can see what my sales are like by division, brass, wind, electronic. But if I wanted to, I could simply drag and drop this information or pivot the information and now see how I'm selling by, by channel instead of by division. Yeah. I can make all sorts of different pivots. You know, or create a, you know, a summary by international sure. version as well. All right, Joan, uh, Excel 5 runs on 68K Mac or Power Mac. Uh, any idea what the delta is, how much faster this is going to run on a Power Mac? 
depending on the machine that you're coming from and going to, anywhere between two and eight times the speed. All right, that's great, Joan. Thanks a lot. Let's take a look at a real graphics intensive application, and that would be Adobe Photoshop. How you doing, John? It's fine. It's fine. All right, the newest version of Photoshop is 3.0. You've got a na native version for the Power Mac, and mm -hmm. I want to go through some of the things in the new version of Photoshop that really take the juice out of that Power Mac CPU. Sure. All right, let's talk about some of the simple things in Photoshop. You have an image, and you want to do some some manipulation, some adjustments. Give me a few examples. Okay, we've got an image here. In fact, we scanned it in. I could use command keys, or a first-time user could just go in and maybe punch up the brightness and contrast, try to breathe more life into the image. A professional might use full advantage of the Power Mac by using something like our levels control to really spice it up or, or bring back all the rich detail that was there. All right, one of the things that are, that's neat about Photoshop is you can create photos that didn't really exist in the first place, take yeah. a piece from one picture, combine it with a piece in another picture. There's no fish in this particular shot. I think it'd be look a little more interesting if I had a fish underwater there. Uh, show me how I would combine those elements. Let's do just that. I can open up other files, maybe a photograph of some fish or a little piece of one, and then just bring them into the background. I'll use a new feature in the program, something that we're able to show you quickly here. Command keys give me my favorite palettes. And if I use something like our paths menu, I can quickly select that fish. And then just by dragging him over, put him into the background here very quickly and easily and be able to pick it up move it around. I can even resize it with an effect like scaling and make sure it's the way I imagined it to be as you see here. All right, we've combined the two elements now, but suppose I want to do a little work just on the fish, just in the background. One of the beauties of the program and, and the PowerPC environment is I can actually pull them back and, and just work on them separately, right? That's right. Layers, it's a big new feature. Basically, you go into a palette called layers and you have the ability to see the fish independently from the background. If I want to give it its own unique name, I can type in whatever I want. I'll just call it the fish. And here, what you're seeing in these small thumbnail views is a way of distinguishing the fish and being able to drag it around or maybe change its opacity at some time, lighten it up, make it a little bit translucent, play with it completely in an independent way of the background. Can I do the same thing with text if I were doing commercial stuff or a magazine cover or something like that? Very much so. In fact, that's going to be a big win. A lot of people, and that freedom to add more layers, opens great doors because they could use our text tools. And as you'll see me do here, just click once on the image, take advantage of all the fonts that are loaded into my Macintosh. Here we're speaking to all the PostScript Type 1, even the True Type fonts, and be able to type something in or drag it in from the clipboard and see the characters at full size. If I type the word Adobe, for example, maybe I'll beef up the point size mm -hmm. to 143 points and then click OK. I'll see as white lettering or whatever color I've picked up, that appear independently on the screen. And again, with this layers idea, I can call it my own unique layer, text here, and be able to freely mix and match that, move it around today, tomorrow, whatever, or even rearrange the order of those layers as you see me working here. Let's talk about one of the neatest things in Photoshop and Photoshop and one of the most computation intensive things and that's the filters you use in which you can really adjust lighting and, and, and things like that. Show me how you do it. Sure. I'll put this guy away, maybe drop everything out and then show you how maybe if I take a scene uh, someplace far away like Athens, Greece, there's a marvelous new filter that lets me add a whole new dimension to it. If you've got a fixed lighting condition like we have here, Maybe I'll go in and not just soften it up or add noise or distort it somehow. I'll actually change the feel of lighting by our lighting effects mm -hmm. filter. And in this case, the program will take and build a small proxy, a little window that you see here. I can move a lighting source a bit like you've got. I can add other colored lights into the background and dramatically change this in some very creative ways. And I'll take full advantage of the Power Mac because these are very computationally intensive sure. operations. When I like the creative effect I've got, I say OK, and then watch it work and do its glory on the full image. And these could be giant files and boom, done just like that. That's right. Real quick, uh, rough delta on performance Power Mac uh, running Photoshop 3 versus a quadra, say? Sure, easily two to four times. Depending on the function, yeah. some of these functions might be as many as eight to ten times wow. the speed. OK, thanks. If anybody should know about Macintosh computers, it should be the folks at the University of Texas in Austin. They own about 5,000 Macs, and they just bought 750 Power Macs. So we thought we'd visit them to find out what benefits they're deriving from using the power PC chip. Large institutions are seldom first to make the leap to new technology, but the University of Texas jumped at the new Power Macintoshes. You can find the Power PC based Macs in student computer labs, classrooms, on professors' desks, and in administrators' offices. 
In this graphics design area, PowerMax are speeding up the development of a new interactive kiosk called the iTower. The new kiosks provide schedules, event calendars, and information on how to navigate the campus through a colorful touchscreen interface. The latest generation will include more elaborate use of QuickTime video, the kind of application that demands fast processing power. If it's faster, it's got to be better. Some of it you've got to have, or you want to have, so you can do uh, you know, research data collection, or you've got more cycles there. People like to be able to take large spreadsheets, okay, where they actually are doing statistical analysis and have it calculate quicker. It's being able to run half a dozen applications at the same time or being able to do presentations where you have snappy color graphics or be able to rotate a molecule in 3D. It's the kind of thing instead of 16 frames per second like Charlie Chaplin would use, you'd want to have that 30 frame per second, you know, Hollywood uh, to those kinds of uh, uh, presentations that you may do. The University of Texas does have some Intel IBM machines, but most desktop computers are Macintoshes, a fact which influenced the move to the new PowerPC-based Macs. Many end users don't see it as a radical shift to a new platform, but as a faster, fancier Mac. The reason that people have gone ahead and started buying into the Power Macintosh technology the, with the Power PC is, is not because it's, uh, it's this big, fantastic, brand new change. It's because it's the next intelligent step for that particular product. Um, it's, if it were really scary, people wouldn't be buying into it. If it were a real risk, uh, people would be waiting a whole lot longer. It, it's intelligent. It's an intelligent upgrade. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Giles Bateman. Now, we've looked at Excel and Photoshop running on a Power Mac, and they look pretty good. But would they have run just as well on a Pentium machine? We're going to find out. Here to help us with our benchmark test of the PowerPC chip are two Apple folks, Stephen Doherty and Jim Gable. All right, first of all, Stephen, what's the hardware we're going to be comparing here? Here we have a Power Macintosh 7100. It's a 66 megahertz PowerPC processor, 601. It has 16 megabytes of memory and a level 2 cache. This is a compact Desk Pro 566. It's a 66 megahertz Pentium, 16 megabytes of memory, and a level 2 cache. All right, I'm going to ask you to compare three different kinds of applications now. We have Painter up here right now, and we're going to do an effect in Painter and explain what that effect's going to be, Stephen. We are going to apply a uh, paper texture to this image, so it's going to make it look as though it's on a very grainy paper. Okay, you guys ready to, to do this first one? Ready to go. What we'll do is we'll set up the texture the same on both displays. And when you give us a sign, we'll start at the same time. You ready? Ready, get set, go. Now what you'll see here is it goes through the surface texture. You get a progress bar. And you can watch the Power Mac here halfway done already. And in fact, the Power Mac is going to be finishing so up quite like a bit faster. So you're running like two faster. to one here faster. Again, and that's an image manipulation a lot of people do in kind of design studios, places like that. Sure. All right, and uh, we're just getting done here over here on our Pentium machine. All right, let's drop out a painter, and I want, want to ask you to bring up FrameMaker, because I want to look at a text example. Not everybody's doing heavy-duty graphics. They might be doing uh, spell checking or search and replace and stuff like that. So let's get up FrameMaker, and then, Jim, tell me what we're going to look at here. Well, FrameMaker is a, is a program that's used to not just do documents, but generally longer documents. And in this situation, what we're going to show is actually a 75-page document. And we're going to show an operation that, of course, writers can do all the time, which is a spell check kind of operation. And I'll scroll down here so you can see some of the text. And basically, we'll set up both machines to be ready to do the spell check, and then you'll start okay. us up. And to be fair, there's not a lot of mistakes here, so we're just going to whip through it and see how long it takes to check. You guys both ready? Ready. Get set, go. You'll see on the screen that you have little waiting cursors for both machines. Uh, but the other thing you're going to find out is on the Power Mac with FrameMaker, we're now finished. Yeah. And we're still waiting on the other machine. Whereas with the Power Mac, I could scroll through my document, I could change the sizes. And you're, move on, you're on to your next task already. Basically, I'm working with my document now, moving images around, whatever I'd like to do. So it's a real productivity gain, not just for design professionals, but also people doing publishing, documentation, that yeah, kind of thing. And we're still waiting we're for, just, okay, Pentium just done. All right, let's get out of this and get into Delta Graph uh, Pro, and let's do a really heavy-duty 3D kind of chart, which would really push these processors uh, to their max. And again, Jim, what are we going to be showing here? Well, what Delta Graph is the kind of program that people might be using in business to graph maybe complicated operations or a lot of different kinds of data. 
And we have a graph here that we're going to show basically a 3D rendering of some, some different data. And once again, we're going to set up the same kind of graph on both of them and uh, let you start us again at the same time. Okay, so this is what, about 2,500 cells in here that we're going to push into this graph. You both ready? You ready, Steve, on your side? Ready, set, go. So what you see is as the machines start, the Power Mac will start the graph much more quickly. And as it powers through the graph, you'll see we're building it a lot more quickly as mm -hmm. well. So this might not be a design person. This might be an engineer. This might be a financial analyst who's having to analyze a lot of different data. And in fact, now the Power Mac is finished with the first graph. And while the Pentium is still working on that first graph, let's look and take the Power Mac at some different views of the data. So I'll actually do a second graph on the Power Mac. And again, this graph is another 3D rendering of the data, but a slightly different angle on it. So you're essentially doing two really complex 3D renderings here. Right. In fact, I'll come back and even do a third. So I'll take the button, do a smooth rendering of the data, and the Power Mac will then give us that display also. And the Power Mac's going to finish before the Pentium finishes the first one. All right. I want to ask you now, to be fair, you're both from Apple. <laughs> You have a vested stake here. Is there anything weird about the hardware, about the software that distorts the results? Stephen? Well, Pentium is slower than PowerPC. I think that's one thing we need to bear in mind. But uh, these are very similar. This is Delta Pro, Delta Graph Pro 2.0 on Windows, and this is Delta Graph Pro 3.5 for the uh, PowerPC. So you're not cheating in terms of video, memory, anything like that? Here. No. In fact, Compaq, the Compaq machine is using accelerated graphics card, and we're not using any sort of accelerated graphics on the uh, 7100. Quickly, Jim, why? I mean, why are you so much faster? 266 well, you're really hertz? Seeing, you're really seeing the benefit of the RISC technology. Of course, the Pentium chip is stretching the old SIS technologies. And especially in some of these situations here, what you're seeing is some mathematical calculations, but in a wide variety of tasks, document processing, uh, doing something with a big image, and analysis of data. So those are different kinds of users, but they all can take advantage of the RISC chip because of its mathematical capabilities. Great. Thanks, guys. All right, let's go over here and join Stavko Podolsky from Insignia Hi. Solutions. And here's the question I have for you. I've just seen this demo of PowerPC, the Power Macintosh. Very impressive. I want one, but I'm a Windows kind of guy. I have Windows apps. I have all my documents in Windows. I want to be able to do both. Now, you have something called Soft Windows that lets me do both? That's right. We have Soft Windows, which does exactly that. It lets you run Windows and DOS applications on your Power Macintosh. And it's a pure piece of software. You don't need to put plug in any cards or anything like that. It just runs like a normal app. So let me show you. Here we have the Soft Windows icon. We just double click on it and it'll start up. The first thing it'll do is go into a DOS screen. So and we're loading DOS in our Power Mac. Indeed we are. And a lot of people still run DOS programs. And I won't demonstrate DOS except to the extent that you can see it running on the screen there. I'll just type Win, which is the usual way to start Windows. And it's, you can see uh, the official Microsoft logo there. there. There's Windows on a Power Mac. There it is indeed. Right, what so happens? Hmm? Yeah, let, let me ask you now, has Windows taken over my Mac or can I still use my Macintosh applications? Okay, Windows has not taken over your Mac by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, your Macintosh applications can still be running at the same time. Uh, all that's happened is that the menu bar has been taken away to give you as much screen area as possible. But the menu is just a keystroke away. Okay, so I can see we're still inside the Mac. And as you can see, I'm running a number of Macintosh applications at the same time as Exactly. Let me ask you that about applications. I mean, it's only really useful to me if I can use applications in both environments. Can I use a Windows app? Can I use a Macintosh application at the same time? Absolutely. In fact, let me show you a Windows application running. And this is a particularly famous Windows application. The most important Windows app solitaire. Indeed. And here we have um, some cards. And not particularly good set of cards as far as I can see but um, I can move them, mm -hmm. right? And uh, the performance in these cards is important to people, especially if they've only got a limited battery life on their, on okay. their machines. But uh, the important thing is that you can take the data from this application, uh, just like this, and you can paste it. So you can copy it out of the mm -hmm. Windows application, and it's now available to a Mac application to paste in. So we'll switch to a Macintosh application. And we have a report here that's nearly ready. So this is a Microsoft Word on the Macintosh document, a text document, and you're going to pull in a graphic from Windows. Absolutely. And I do it using the normal Macintosh. There's a cut things. and paste going from Windows to the Mac. There you go. That's great. 
One quick question. You're using an emulation here. People are concerned that means it slows things down a bit. How slow will Windows run here on the Mac? Okay, it's a, it's a very important question because um, to maintain compatibility, you always need to have some trade-offs. And the trade-off in the past has been um, that you had to lose some performance. Now, the risk processor, the PowerPC processor in the Power Macintosh gives us enough performance, as you've seen, and we reckon using benchmarks and also using independent reports, getting roughly a 25 megahertz 486SX performance on so an entry-level Power Mac. Loss. No. Thanks a lot. That's our look at the PowerPC on this week's Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffee. We'll see you here next time.